So let's talk about what was actually going on for me in my body during my time out. Because it was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot. Um, so prior to launch day, we were all camping together at our little base camp there. And we were eating as much as we could. Everybody was definitely stuffing themselves, trying to put on as much weight as possible before going out. And that was, that was hard, certainly. Definitely, I said this during the summer and at base camp, like, whoo, I'm actually really looking forward to being hungry for a while after just forcing myself to eat more than I wanted to for a while. So one of my 10 items was two pounds of pemmican, which ended up being about like that big. And my inclination was to set that aside and not use that for weeks. However, the same survival expert who has done a lot of work on survival situations and starving, his advice was not to wait to eat your rations, not to wait to eat. Because the thing that happens when you do that is your digestive system will start to shut down. So that then when and if you do get food, it's not able to process it and it can just pass through you or you won't be getting as much of the good out of your food as if you hadn't let it shut down on you. So I really took that advice to heart. So my plan was to focus on shelter for the first handful of days before really working hard to get food off of the land. So I did that and I think it was a really good choice, particularly given that we had snow on day three and I focused on using some of my emergency rations rather than focusing on foraging. So I certainly was eating berries off of the land, but I wasn't trying hard to fish or hunt for just those first handful of days. And I think that that was really good because eating a little bit more of my rations than I did later on as kind of my, my daily amount, I feel like it really helped my body transition from tons of calories to very, very minimal calories. So, and when I say a ration, maybe I was eating like a tablespoon worth of pemmican every day or two for those first couple days. Spoiler, I had pemmican all the way up until the day they pulled me out. So I really rationed that stuff and I made it last. So I was out there for 73 days. Any day that I had significant other food, not just berries, but significant other food, I wasn't eating it. And I went a lot of days without eating it early on just to conserve it. But even the days I was eating some, it was a very meager ration. So those first couple days, I was eating a little bit more of it just to help my body transition between a lot of food and little food. That said, I also was really trying to eat the berries, but you know, the berries that I had access to on my site, I had a few blueberries, but nowhere near what it looks like other people had. And even those were like old and sour and a little bit withered. Their season was definitely past. I mean, all of the leaves were already red and falling. So very few of the blueberries and not wonderfully delicious anymore by the time I got there. So mostly what I had were cranberries and crowberries. And crowberries are a little small blackberry and they grow very low to the ground. And they are very watery, not even what I would call juicy. They're mostly water and it wasn't particularly sweet and it didn't feel very substantive. I didn't force my body to take in something that it was very clearly telling me it didn't want to. And again, this feels really important and like an important survival skill because if we are someone who's uncomfortable enough with hunger that will just put anything in regardless of our body's message about it, then we're more likely to do ourselves more damage rather than good. And we saw this in season five with Jesse where he was so hungry and he ate like half a tree worth of inner bark and then he was crippled with horrible cramps and it ended up bringing him out right your body can't process that much fiber especially if your digestive system has been shut down from so little food and those seeds while it wasn't that kind of quantity my body was like no no this is not okay and so i didn't force it to do that because i know that making yourself throw up when you're in a survival situation is the worst thing for you, 
way worse than having a little bit less fiber or a little bit less food. Also diarrhea, super bad for you, super depleting, dehydrating, not good. Or the opposite, constipation, really big issue. So anytime you're forcing your body to take in something your body says no to, you're risking one of those issues. And it did not feel worth it to me. So I'm glad I made that choice. So the other thing was cranberries, and I was eating as many cranberries as I could manage, which wasn't very many because they're really sour, super sour, especially at that point in the season. And when they're that sour, they have no calories, right? It's very, very little calories because there's no sugar. Sugar is the main calorie in berries. So I was making myself eat the cranberries, which I could get down, so I was getting fiber from those, but they were so sour, they would kind of eat away at my, at my mouth a bit. And there was one day when I was like, okay, so I'm going to try making the cranberries more palatable. So I added a bunch to some water and I added some fat from my pemmican because I know fat really helps your digestion, helps your body in every way and helps you take in vitamins. And I knew that vitamin C was one of the main things I was getting from these cranberries. So I ate that and it was horribly sour and it was hard to get down. But I had added some of my fat to it. And fat is absolutely your most precious resource out there. So I didn't want to waste the fat. So I did make myself eat all of the rest of that. And it did make me feel a little sick, not throw up sick, but it just gave me a sour stomach for several days. And it made it so that cranberries weren't really appealing to me. So at that point, I kind of stopped eating the cranberries. And I was like, well, there's almost no calorie in them and they didn't feel good to my body. So that's fine. I'll just let those go. So that was the period during which I was very hungry. So I didn't start fishing until about day four, but where I was, all I had was like a foot, foot and a half deep water, zero access to deep water where the big fish would be. So I tried so many different things. I had two different poles, one to the north, and one to the south, so I didn't have to carry these big poles around the thick brushy forest. I had all kinds of tackle, all kinds of lures I had made, and weights and floats, and tried every different place to fish, and it just wasn't happening. But every day from day four to day 14, that was, that was what I was putting a lot of energy towards because I was determined. But as time went on, it became increasingly obvious that I just didn't have a fishing location. Fishing wasn't gonna happen for me. Finally, that day that you saw me get the grouse, I had gone fishing in the morning. I was on my way back from my fishing spot. It was the equinox. So I'm on my way back from fishing and I see a squirrel in a low branch and I shoot it and I take that squirrel right off of the tree and pin it down to the ground. And then I'm on my way back with that very squirrel when I see that grouse that you shot, saw me shoot. So all of, you know, a couple weeks at that point without any animal food. And then I get two animals in one moment. So that was a huge switch. That day was I feel like in some ways the start of my time. <laughs> so what had been going on for me physically before I got that squirrel and grouse? Well, I had gone very hungry. I had gotten a little bit sick from the cranberries and then I was having some other physical issues. The first was all of these horrendous cold sores and that I believe is from the stress of pre-launch, particularly I had a tremendous amount of stress because I was trying to bring as much homemade gear as I could and it wasn't finished. So I was staying up until the wee hours in my little tent by headlamp right up until the day of launch, not getting enough sleep, really stressed I wouldn't finish in time. So I got those sores and then I was going through this period of not, not bringing in protein. So what did my body have to do repairs with? Nothing. So they just kind of stayed unfortunately. And additionally, I had gotten this horrible, horrible rash on the backs of my thighs, huge raised, like throbbing welts on the backs of my thighs that I couldn't figure out. It felt like some kind of allergic contact reaction. It didn't feel like it was spider bites. I wasn't sure how that could be the case or any other insect bites. I didn't know what it was, but what was also happening for the, me at this point was 
my system was not really functioning the way it normally does, right? Because I was taking in so little food, just teeny little bits of pemmican and teeny little amounts of berries. So I wasn't pooping. Basically, I pooped for the first like maybe six days until I had pooped out all that I had eaten pre-launch. And then there was so little coming, coming in that very little was coming out. So I would have these horrendous welts and then they would start to feel better and then they would get worse again and then they were feeling better and I couldn't figure it out. And by about say day nine or so, I would say, they started to get better and better and better and that was great. It's like, well, I don't know what caused it, but luckily they're going away. And again, not eating very much, but then in the third week out, I got that squirrel and grouse, and then I had more food coming in. And then another thing happened for me physically, day 26, which was I got my period, and that can tend to move everything through. And so I did end up pooping at that point. And after that, after having gone a couple weeks without pooping and then pooping again, that night my legs were just on fire throbbing, pulsing, burning pain. And that was when I realized what's the one thing that happened today that hasn't been happening since day nine, the last time my legs were really bad. And also that would be touching the backs of my legs. And then for the first time I figured it out. It was while I was squatting to poop, I was squatting in the sphagnum moss undergrowth and Labrador tea was one of the plants in that undergrowth that was the tallest thing that was brushing the backs of my thighs. So I had been having a contact dermatitis reaction to Labrador tea. Not a common allergen, but apparently I'm allergic to it. Who knew? So finally I figured that out. Again, at that point, I was starting to bring meat in and luckily it started to heal. My lips were healed by that time and my, the backs of my legs started to get better. Very, very slow process of getting better. Just as of now, I would say, you can't see the scars. But when I first came out on day 74, was looking at the backs of my legs in a mirror, still huge, like purpley, bruisey looking areas where all of those welts had been. So that was a significant physical factor that I was going through. They didn't really start to really go back to normal and cl the skin close up until day 55 or so. And another thing is that I was having really different responses to hunger throughout my time. So those first couple weeks when I wasn't bringing in animal food and was really trying to be as conservative as I could with my pemmican, but still eating a little bit and eating some berries, those were my hungriest times when I felt the hunger most in my body. And what would happen is I could really notice the grade in the land. It was a bit of a climb to get up from the water and just bringing my little cook pot full of water up from the lake. I was feeling it. I was feeling it in my legs. They were feeling sore and weak and occasionally feeling it a little bit lightheaded. And I thought, oh, I must be really hungry. Well, then I went on for months after that, just as hungry, but my symptoms were worse in those first couple weeks. It was the only time that I felt weak, weak from hunger in my body. I felt hungry the whole time, but I didn't feel weak again until the very, very end. So that was really interesting. And again, I think it was just my body transitioning from being one that's used to getting food when it wants food to all of a sudden being one that getting food was a special and a rare treat. And so at that point, you know, I certainly had the sensation of hunger all throughout, but the physical sensations of it were, were much more acute early on, which I wasn't expecting. So two weeks without any food and then being successful with my bow and bringing in animal food for the first time and some of my injury is starting to heal and then trapping and being able to bring in food a little bit more consistently. Now, I was never getting enough food that I was eating as much as I wanted every day. I was still being very conservative. I was definitely burning more calories than I was putting in pretty much every day out there with maybe a couple exceptions. Then, all of a sudden, 
around the mid 30s, my traps stop producing very well. And I've talked about this in other videos. So two things. One, the fox moved in and started clearing out my traps. But even in areas where I didn't see fox tracks, I wasn't seeing rabbit tracks. They just weren't around and I didn't know what was happening. And it turns out it was the rabbit molt and they lay low at that time. So I went another section of like two weeks without bringing in food. Maybe it was more like 10 days, but a long time without bringing in food. And I was really hungry. And this was a whole different kind of hunger because I didn't feel weak in my body from the hunger but it was much more of like a deep psychological hunger where I just thought about food all the time. Particularly, I thought about the period of time when I had lived in Thailand and was eating this amazing, rich, flavorful, incredible food all the time. I was just living in Northern Thailand in my mind for some of those weeks. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a different kind of hunger where I was perfectly capable, never felt like I wasn't strong and that my legs or anything else was having a hard time with the hunger but it was definitely a deeper level of hunger which makes sense because my reserves were low so another thing that they don't tell you about what was happening with me physically in my time out is I dropped a lot of weight from early on in my time so those couple of first weeks without getting in much food made a big impact on my weight. The first medical check we had was day 21. And when they came out and weighed me, I had lost exactly 21 pounds. So I was losing a pound a day early on. And then that day was the day that my trap started producing. So from that point, my weight loss did in fact slow. And I think it was a combination of me getting more food and being way less hungry than I was in those first couple weeks, but also my body being in ketosis, being used to the hunger and used to making every calorie really count. So that I think was a huge thing for me. And then I started getting game again, which was wonderful. You saw my Halloween feast. So at that point I was starting to get squirrels as well in my traps. And still again, you know, it was very rare for me to have more food than I needed or enough food to save for a couple days into the future. I was very, very conscientious of how I ate the animals and making absolutely every bit count, right? I was always uh, browning the meat and then cooking it down in water, doing a braise until it was just dripping off of the bones and then leaving some on the bones so that there would still be something for my bone stock when I would cook those up again. And then after doing that a couple of times, cracking the bones and eating the marrow, making little marrow picks with the bones so that I could get every bit, eating the ends off of the bones. That was a key practice for me, eating everything that I could. So really making good use. And that feast was something such a big deal. It really buoyed my spirits to have everything I wanted to eat in one sitting. It was amazing for sure. And then again, the trapping started to decline and that was when it was starting to get really deep winter. Stormy weather was really bad for trapping. The animals were just not moving. The fox came back also and that was really a problem um, so it just got harder and harder and then also the rabbits were getting smarter and smarter and figuring out my traps and once again I didn't have snare wire that was a huge handicap I had fishing line and the rabbits got more and more clever and got to where they saw a fishing line and they just clipped it out of the way right you can't do that with snare wire maybe one rabbit sees it and goes around but the next rabbit might not be so smart and might go through it but if that first rabbit can just clip it out of the way, then so much of my time and energy ended up being spent resetting traps that had been disabled by those smart, smart bunnies. I've always loved bunnies. I hadn't given them credit for being super smart previously, but dang, I think differently now. It was like it spread out from the peninsula through the network of rabbit runners. I'm being facetious. I know that's not actually how it works, but truly the knowledge of knowing to recognize my traps went further than the areas I had already been trapping. So there were so many factors, but basically the food was starting to really slump for me as the temperatures were getting cold. And I was still holding out for the ice to come for two reasons. One was so that I could be ice fishing, which I was super excited about. And then two, I had been scoping out where I thought a beaver lodge was in the area. So 
I had realized that the Beaver Lodge was on an island and I didn't have access to it early on. So I was just waiting for the ice to come and be able to get to the Beaver Lodge. So ice meant ice fishing and potentially access to the Beaver Lodge. So as the ice is coming and my trapping is declining, I'm holding out hope for those methods to get food in. Unfortunately, that ice froze so thick, so fast. It went from three inches to 18 inches thick within a handful of days. So I could totally bust through the ice with the butt end of my saw pretty easily when it was three inches thick. 18 inches, it was not happening. And I had no idea that the ice could form that quickly. Maybe I should have guessed because it's the Arctic, but I didn't know. So unfortunately, by the time ice fishing could have worked for me, I didn't have access to the lake. So that's what was starting to happen for me was still feeling good, still wanting to be there, but recognizing that my food resources were drying up and taking more and more effort for me to bring in as I had less and less reserves in my body and as the temperatures were colder and colder. And cold temperatures just melt through your fat so fast. I didn't realize how fast. There was a text on the screen saying that I was losing a pound and a half a day, which is huge. And I didn't know that, but I was finally starting to get the rate of change or the degree of change that had happened in my body. I didn't realize it at first because I felt so good. I knew I was getting skinny, but I didn't feel like I was problematically skinny, even though they had given me a health warning about how skinny I was getting on day 40. So as of day 40, I knew I was on health watch, but I didn't pay too much attention. because I was like, you know what? But I feel great. I feel so healthy and strong. Here's another thing is that I had gone in with some chronic health stuff. Like I've had bad shoulders since my twenties. And I had, since I lived in Thailand, I had injured my Achilles tendons and I had really tight Achilles tendons and kind of a hip that sometimes bothered me. All of my physical issues went away out there. I felt great. I felt better than ever. So I didn't take getting skinny too seriously, but towards the end of my time, I started to be aware that something was really shifting and I finally started paying attention to how skinny I was. So they would remark on it when they came to do medical checks and they would always have me pull my shirt up and looking down at my belly was the only time I got freaked out about my body because the skin on my belly looked like I was 80 years old. It was all wrinkled and papery and droopy weird because I had just lost that weight so fast. So I had gotten to where I stopped looking at my belly and the medical checks because it just freaked me out. And they'd ask me, how does it feel to be this skinny? And I'd be like, I don't know. I just don't really pay attention. I mean, I'm wearing five layers all the time. So it's not like I was really looking at or interacting with my body in those ways very much. But the thing that really made me pay attention was, I think it was in the last couple weeks, probably the last, I don't know, 10 days or so, when I would be out running my trap line. And at this point I have, I have my kidney warmer tucked into my clothes. I have two layers of long underwear, plus the leg warmers, plus two, sometimes three pairs of socks, plus my pants. So I had a lot of layers. But all of them, I knew where they were. And then I started having the sensation of something weird bunching up in my pants, like, you know, sitting on this bunched up thing or just feeling this bunched up thing. And I would check and I'd be like, there's nothing in there. What's going on? Finally, sometime in that last week, I realized what it was I was feeling. It was my underwear. <laughs> because my underwear was not actually touching my body anymore. It was just dangling loosely around inside my pants so that when I would move, sometimes it would bunch up here or there. So underwear that was tight on my body, all of a sudden I didn't even have a butt anymore. So it was just all of this loose material in my pants. That was a wake up. And that was the point too, when for the very first time, I started noticing it being a little bit harder physically to do the things I needed to do. Not that I wasn't perfectly capable of doing them. It was just harder to get the motivation, like to get up from sitting and go and do something all of a sudden took a while and took a lot of effort, whereas it never had before. 
you can probably guess from watching my time out and these videos, I'm a very motivated person. Getting, getting the will up to do something is usually really not an issue for me. And all of a sudden it was. I was starting to get to that point where I knew I was starving. And that was the moment too, where I got out onto the ice and realized I wasn't getting through it. There were no fish coming in. And I made it out to where that beaver lodge I thought was. And sure enough, there it was, but it was totally impenetrable. It was, it was big old logs packed in with clay and no sign of activity above the water. And beaver have exits below the water. So if I put effort to digging in to that beaver lodge, they'd be out and under the ice and inaccessible in no time. So that wasn't an option. So here, the food options I had been holding out for were gone. My traps really weren't producing. I couldn't get through the ice and I was finally aware of how deeply shrunken my body was. That choice on day 73 to leave was a big one and it was really, really hard. But I was right at that point where I had been feeling so strong and good for so long out there. It had been such an amazing experience. I'd been doing everything I said I wanted to in terms of really representing myself and my values and my way of going about things and my connection to the natural world and honoring the land and the ancestors. I'd been doing all of those things. And it was getting to where I was finding it harder to do that. And I could feel that while my health hadn't super tanked, I knew that my body had given just about everything that it had. I was at zero stored resources and I knew that I was walking up to the edge of that cliff, you know, and I did not want to step over it. And I would rather leave while I still had that strength and still was holding the values that I hold dear and be that, have that be the example I'm leaving with the world. And so you can see it as I'm leaving. Here they are all ready to, you know, help my shrunken form to the helicopter, but I was still fine. I hefted that big heavy bag onto my shoulders and walked it to the helicopter myself. And they were ready for me to not be that physically fit, but I totally was, right? It's just that I knew that I couldn't be for very much longer. I was getting pretty clear that one, it was getting down to me and one, maybe two other people. I really felt by the end that it was down to just me and one person. I knew how close I probably was to winning and I realized that that didn't matter at all. In fact, that just made my decision all the more important, all the more impactful for me and for the world of people watching to know that I was choosing myself and my body and my health first, even though I was so close. Second, I knew that there was a medical check coming and I knew that I was very unlikely to pass that medical check. They were coming that day regardless. And I knew that I might be looking at right in that one day, the choice between leaving on my own and leaving because they pulled me. And while up until the very end, I had thought that doing well and strength and success was giving it my all and staying until they pulled me out of there, kicking and screaming. All of a sudden that's, I realized, no, success is choosing for myself what's right for me and going when I choose and on my own terms. And that was the day that I had in order to make that. It, maybe I could have made it another medical check, but I didn't think it was very likely. And after I left, I found out that in fact, they were planning to pull me at that medical check. So either way, I was leaving that day, but because I did it myself, I got to leave fully empowered really in charge of my experience and knowing that I was still in that same state of reverence and appreciating the beauty and love and connection with which I had come. And that is how I wanted to leave. Which brings us to part three and how my physical recovery was. And I believe part of why I did better physically in my recovery than some other folks is because I made that choice myself. And what that did for me physically and psychologically was huge. So to wrap this segment, talking about how my body did physically out there, I want to let you know that when they came to pick me up, I had lost 50 pounds. I am a small woman. I am five foot four, 
50 pounds was a huge percentage of my body weight. 33, over 33% of my body weight. That is more than any woman has ever lost in the history of this show, and it is as high a percentage as anyone has ever lost. Barry and I lost the same percent of our body weight. Barry lost 80 pounds, but he is a big dude with a big frame and capacity to carry a lot more. I am a small person. I am far smaller than any of the people who were the last four out there. Right, so Nikki left and the rest of us were out there for another three weeks. That's me, little me, with not very much on my frame, with three big dudes who went in there with so much more calorie packed on their frame. So my body had given so much. That's what I'm talking about when I say, man, have I asked a lot of this body and it is absolutely given and I can't ask for any more. I really believe that it was the power of positive thinking and that land wanting me there and those relationships and all of the people back home praying for me and beaming me calories and me believing in that that is part of why I was able to do so physically well and still be so strong with a tremendous, tremendous loss of body weight. So, you know, we will never know what would have happened had I stayed longer. And as it turns out, I wouldn't have had the option to stay longer. Maybe in another week something could have happened to Jordan, but you know, he was still doing really, really well. And another week could have seen me on dialysis for the rest of my life. As it is, I am strong and healthy and fit, and I'm already back to just about how I was in my body before this whole thing started. And I feel good and strong. I went for a four mile run this morning and I felt great. Would I give that up for $500,000? Are you kidding me? You can pay me enough money to give up my healthy physical body. So I am so proud of what I did and I protected this body and it has bounced back. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about what happened from when they pulled me and my recovery in part three. <laughs>